Welcome to What's Inspired Me. I'm going to be telling you about Hamlet uh, by William Shakespeare and my sort of life-changing experience of reading that. And I'll say you do not need to be a Shakespeare expert by any means or to have read him or know much about him at all. Uh, so I hope you enjoy. I don't know what your experience of Hamlet and Shakespeare is, um, but I know for a lot of people it can be very intimidating. For me, I didn't read Hamlet, I didn't read Shakespeare outside of high school really at all. And even in high school, he was it wasn't accessible to me. I think every year you read a Shakespeare play, and yet, um, for the most part, it was the movies, it was the other things that you did around it that really stood out to me. I don't really remember tracking it. You know, in class you might read through the play uh, and people would take turns, but you you may be like me where a lot of that just went kind of one in one ear and out the other. Um, but there's a lot of there's a lot of different ways people approach him. You may love Shakespeare, and just earlier this summer, I met uh, I met a girl, a homeschool a woman, a homeschool mom who reads Shakespeare every single day. And, um, you know, maybe there are people who make their livelihood on studying Shakespeare, certainly. But um, there's a lot of different experiences that people bring and have, and the name Shakespeare is, can be daunting, it can be off-putting, it can seem like this monumental, this iconic thing that's so out of reach, that's so difficult to approach, um, that it can be difficult to, to talk about the subject. Also, as Alan, Alan Rickman talked about the great Snape from Harry Potter, he, he made a great comment about Hamlet that said, there's something about it that makes everybody feel like it's their own play, and they feel uniquely protective of Hamlet. For me, I'm not, I wasn't a big reader of literature. The way that I came across this more recently, it was about two and a half years ago, maybe about three years ago, that I first read Hamlet as an adult and really comprehended it, and which is what I'm sharing with you now, my experience of reading it three years ago. I was doing sort of a weekly reading group just with my friend Corey and I, and we would meet, both of us had back, have backgrounds in theology and philosophy, and that's pretty much what we'd be reading, what we'd be talking about, that was our, our comfort zone. And over time, we were starting to feel like something new, something different was on the horizon. Corey's great always with trying to broaden our, our reading and our experiences. He's, um, he, he loves bringing in the classics and referring to them and suggesting them. And so there was a time when it, it came to think about something different than just theology or philosophy that we were pretty comfortable, pretty well versed in. I think you threw the ball into my court at that point, and I was the one sort of sitting sitting there thinking about what I was going to what we were going to read together and over you know a little bit of a process I came to Shakespeare and I came to Hamlet being regarded as maybe the most representative Shakespeare play a lot of people will say that it's it's maybe the greatest if you can say there's a greatest Shakespeare play and so we kind of dove in the deep end with that one and started right away into that and approaching it was was interesting I think when you do a reading group or club of, of, of any form, as you're reading, there's a one part of your mind is always thinking, what are we going to talk about when we get together here? And if the book's a real, real, you know, uphill battle, then you're just thinking the whole time, like, we're just going to sit there and talk about how our weeks went because none of this made sense. We're not going to be, we have nothing really to go on here. And I, I wondered if that was going to happen to us. I, we were both just going to try to read through the Shakespeare text and come together and think, I don't know, I don't know, I have no idea what happened. But the amazing thing was that is not what happened. It was, it was, it was surprising, as surprising to me as anybody else, that as soon as I read it, like within the first few pages, it felt like it was completely alive to me. And I felt I had the strongest sense that I could see Shakespeare's heart in this. I, the words, the language, the brilliance, so much of it was over my head. And... There's things I'm sure I'm wrong about in understanding it, but besides all of that, I felt like I was really getting his point in the play. I was feeling, you know, the pulse of this play. 
and I did not expect to get that, certainly not at the, at the earliest stages of it. And so we went into that experience together diving in, uh, and, and it turned out to be quite life-changing, really, um, changing the course of my life, the, the nature of it, and so many things opening it up in ways that I didn't expect. So that's how I came across this, and that's what this video is about, a little bit reflecting on that first experience, reflections I had then and, and that have matured and have thickened and continued on since then. We went on, Corey and I went on to read um, Macbeth together. We also went on to read Romeo and Juliet. I think that was my choice, actually, that one, but, uh, <laughs> and we'll probably get back to these things. Also, as a side note, I'll just mention this. I came in, I would come into our readings, and this is what I brought with me. You can't really see this. We just have a few handwritten notes from me on the front, and it just comes into a printed out play. I printed it with my own printer at home. There's no binding at all. It's just free paper with some of these things on the top. You know, and I just, that's, I would walk into the coffee shop with this pad of paper in my hand, and we'd sit down. And Corey is a man of class, and he likes everything. <laughs> to have a bit of a uh, quality to it and so when he would see me with these floppy piece of paper he was not having it was not was not interested in what I was bringing so <laughs> over uh I forget I don't know the timeline but basically one day I showed up to one of our little meetings and we were on the we were on a patio he got there ahead of me and he was sitting there and he had this gigantic tome sitting on the table and I, you know, you could see right there, it caught my eye from a mile away. And I thought, oh, wow, you know, you've really got, what have you got there? And it's the, the complete works of Shakespeare. He started telling me about it and talking about it. And this thing is just gargantuan sitting on the table. And he kind of just looked at me and he said, it's yours. It's enough, you can put those little printed pages, out, you know, out of the way. And this is, we'll use this from now on. You know, I'm not coming in here with you with those pages anymore. So... That was a really nice gesture. He's a good gift giver, um, good book buyer for people as well. And so to Corey, that's a great gift, and I love you, brother. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> yeah. So as far as the play goes, part of me wants to just like go through moment by moment the whole play. Like that, you know, that's really kind of what I first was like that's what needs to be done but of course that can't really be done so just to give you in a nutshell really what i th what i see the play as being just to to enter into the discussion and reflections now you're you're probably familiar enough with the basics of the play it's really a play about hamlet this character hamlet's descent into a kind of revenge fueled um madness and the ending, like many other Shakespeare tragedies, ends in great bloodshed and tragedy. And <laughs> it's a good question of why, why is that going to be maybe one of the first videos of what's inspired me. You might be wondering why that's the case. Maybe suspicious of me at that point, wondering what I'm looking at, you know, what I'm getting from that sort of thing. Certainly, if all you look at it as is that, then there's not much to glean from it but that's sort of the point of what's different that this is not the story simply of a deranged man an unbalanced man uh, a mad man as they as they'll use that phrase in, in the play who's kind of just carrying out what comes natural to him it's not you're not just entering into the mind of someone who's already lost track of reality and they're just carrying out their you know their emotional ragings or something that's not what the play is really about in fact it's really the opposite it's about what makes it so compelling and so profound is that it's about a good man it's about a pure man it's about an innocent man and what needs to happen to a good man to make him do the things that he did and that is really what the whole play turns on and, and revolves around if you're if you're asking me that catches people off guard when i say that a few times in conversation maybe you've seen plays or certain seen movies or seen versions of it where he's more or less um 
either something like a suck or something like um, already deranged, already un unhinged. But when I read the play, I just get totally the, a, different, a totally different thing. The whole point is that he is a pure man and the experiences he has and the hopeless situation he's in is a context in which he, he of all people, this good man, finds himself in this place where he's carrying out these terrible things. And that's really what this thing is about. Yeah, because I don't have all the time in the world, I'll just sort of tell you what I think is the course or the essence of why Hamlet does the things that he does. And it's basically this. Um, the world around him sees every good thing in him as suspect. I'll say that again. The world around him, the people around him, interpret, visualize, scheme, comprehend, guess at every good thing that comes out of him naturally. And they just see it as suspicious, as suspect, as questionable, as wicked. And that is this consistent theme that plays out and develops and intensifies to the point where more and more things are taken from him. He's left more and more alone. He's left more and more to his own, his own thoughts, to his own soul and heart that, that are breaking and, and falling and, you know, falling into darkness. And it's, it's a story of him led into tragedy through that and carrying out these, these, these terrible things. One example that I'm talking about is right near the beginning. His, his father has died, and he doesn't know how at that point. And his uncle marries his mother within, I think it's less than two months. And there's a few nice little jokes about you know, just, a, just a, a little month he describes it and he says that the food from the funeral could have been used at the wedding. It was so quick. And that's the situation that he's in. So he's grieving his father. He now has this uncomfortable change of relationship with his uncle. His mother now comes into question of what is going on with her that a month and a half later she's now remarried. And that's where he's in. That's the state he's in. The natural response is, is utter grief. That's the natural good response of the soul to something like that. And so he's, he's walking around grieving. And the uncle comes around, he sees him, and he kind of says, why are you so gloomy there, mate, basically? And after a while, he kind of opens up, and he's talking about the father. And eventually, the uncle just sort of cuts in to this horrible, biting rebuke of him and a bit of a lecture. You know, he calls him stubborn and he calls his grief unnatural and unmanly and unworthy of, 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 a, of, a, of a good man. You know, and he goes into a lecture about the circle of life and that all fathers die. Everybody loses their father. Every father dies. That's the, that is the necessity of nature. And for you to grieve this way, you are contradicting and blaspheming the laws of heaven, the laws of, of nature, within, within days, really, of his father passing and everything happening. And that's just really a taste. You get the sense of what that would be like. You get the, that's a taste of the world that he's in. He's experiencing real, natural things, and the world around him is looking at it in the most cynical, the most uh, accusatory, the most condemning way possible. And they themselves are the most absurd characters when they look, when you know, in themselves. And so then to look back on him and then call him mad and absurd, it's, that's the irony of it. So you get the sense of the feel of um, the uncle in that one moment. And you can imagine how the story really plays on that. And more and more and more people, he's isolated from people and deemed as um, unhinged and unbalanced for the natural things he's feeling. And uh, most, most stories would, at that point, I didn't say most, but maybe ones that we're more familiar with would have a bit of a turn of events for the better. You know, at the climax, at the worst of it, when it's really feeling like he's hopeless and he's all alone and you'd have the arrival of a certain character, you'd have a change of events around them or a change, an internal change in the main character there. You'd have some change for the better, a saving moment, a certain kind of like redeeming quality that brings him into the light and helps him on the way. But that is not what Shakespeare tended to do. 
and that's not what he's doing here. It's the it's actually the opposite. He's looking at the other way around, and I don't think it's it's out of him being morbid. What I see it as is his way, and he's done it so many times. It's almost like a vocation to him, I think, to go into the darkness. And what he does there is, it's a way of shining light, I really see it as. Because he's showing you what the soul and the nature of human beings and of life is more by going down those dark roads and really showing you what happens and that the fact that we aren't just material beings or something. The moral life, the spiritual life, is irrelevant and we're all just creatures and animals or something or it's all just political power games and that sort of thing and what he does is he'll go right down to the darkness and show you that even in the darkest depths the essence of what we are and of what life is shines out even if it's in terrible circumstances it still shines and that's a lot of what Shakespeare's about so what he's gonna do is show Hamlet he's gonna show the goodness the deepest the inner worthiness and quality of Hamlet as a being, as a human being, in his eyes as a spiritual being, by watching him go all the way down and still retain aspects of that, still shine in so many ways, even when he's carrying out things and when, he, when he's done and he starts to sober up a little more. All around him, he's going to show this, this theme. And that's where, that's where Shakespeare, for me, reading through Shake, through Hamlet this time and then reading the other plays, this is something that stood out to me in a big way. One of the things that makes him completely unique, one of the things that really sets him apart in, 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 the, in the greatest way. And it's basically this, that he had an ability to balance two things. He, he was able to balance, on the one hand, being, like, capturing the gray areas of life the like the unknown the like complexities and the, the, the hard situations you don't have easy answers to the the tragedy and horrors and bleakness and like paradoxes and the questions and the mysteries and the pains and like all of the heaviness and the basically the gray the gray stories and you know categories of gray where things are just like smeared and there's not this clear dichotomy between either or or um, you know, there's not a simple either or in the mix of that. So he can capture that and render that. But here's what he also does as well. He also, in his own his own way, like infuses, I should say more, he himself is infused at the same time with the complete belief in the utter goodness of goodness <laughs> and the darkness of evil. That he's still, even while capturing the gray, he is absolutely infused and animated and alive by the, the absolute distinction between light and darkness, between good and evil. And he never, in the most fundamental ways, he's never, he's never questioning that. Even in the worst stories. Even in the worst stories. And um, that might sound easier to do than it, maybe it really is, but what you'll find a lot of times is if you find a story that is really good at capturing the gray stuff of life, that the mystery, the the hard to explain, that really revels in the unknown stuff, um, what you'll find more often than not is that it can be really bleak. It can be really, really bleak. It can give you a feeling like life just got sucked of all its color and its energy and its hope. And while it's true, it will be true to certain experiences that are gray in character. But at the same time, it loses all of these other things about life that are still true. On the flip side, you might have stories that are all too clear about what's right and what's wrong, light and darkness. That have very, very, very strong convictions about, what, about goodness and evil. And yet, they don't get into the nitty-gritty of of the gray of life, of the, of the horror of life, of the complete um, unexplainable darkness and, and qualities and mysteries and strangenesses that happen. And so all that to say, that is one of the things reading through so many, not so many, but reading through one play after another in Shakespeare is that he has that quality unlike anyone that I know of and maybe above anyone else to render and capture and live out both 
the real experiences that are impossible to explain at this point of life, and at the same time, a complete faith in the goodness of goodness. So that's, that's one of the things that sets him apart in a great way. Now, going forward here, I just want to uh, share basically on one major kind of takeaway, well, kind of a one major focus that, that I'll just highlight in on um, out of you know poss many possibilities, really. But one thing that I came away with from this was actually a different, a different perspective on perfection. Perfection. Hamlet is regarded by many as being the greatest work by the greatest writer who's ever lived. And there's a great aura about it, and there can be a really daunting aspect to it. And so going in, I think I had something of the feeling, if it, with this idea in mind that it really is held up to be maybe, maybe the best if you're if we're really going to rank pieces of writing, you know, the best piece of literature that we have. I'm going in, and I have this 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 idea in mind that I don't even really know I have in mind is that I'm going to read this thing, and and every word is going to be in its proper place, just where it needs to be, and. Every sentence and every paragraph and every scene is going to be balanced just just so, and it's all going to be like perfectly put together in, in, in this neat way, in this perfect way, in this at least close at least as close to perfection as we get. And that I was going to be encountering something like that, but surprisingly, something really different struck me about it, and it was something that I felt more than I could explain at the time, but I certainly felt it. And that instead of, let's say, my expectation was that maybe it was more like all the words were like stones that are you know, used to build a cathedral, and a cathedral is like perfectly designed and it's executed and the craftsmanship and everything is exquisite and everything is rendered just so and it's put in place and it's kind of immovable in a certain degree and when you get the picture it's very stiff it's very strong it's very solid and there's a sense that it all has to be kind of just so and instead of that the, the feeling i had was it was a lot more like a forest it was a lot more like a forest where there was endless textures and possibilities and variety when you're in a forest you don't get the idea that every twig and dry leaf is in just the right spot and if you moved any of it it all be destroyed you would destroy the forest that's not the sense you get you get the sense that it could be changed it could be shifted and moved and altered in so many ways almost infinite ways and still be this beautiful forest that it is and that is that was something that struck me again right away from reading this thing that it was more like that i just felt like it could it just that was the feeling it was like i was walking through a forest and it was like it could all be so many different kinds of ways everything could be moved like and yet it still was enchanting it was still rich it was still something wholesome and uh beautiful and awe-inspiring and all the rest of it and easy and calm and human and natural and organic and all you go on and on but all these things that's the feeling i had about about hamlet and so the more the more i the more i thought about that the more i thought about that difference of perfection it makes me ask what if perfection is more like that than the idea that it's everything is exactly how it needs to be and if you move even the slightest little bit it's all ruined i don't know about you maybe you don't have that feeling but i sort of carried that around apparently you know more than I knew because this started to open it up in really fresh ways for me and this is really relevant for life like daily life I think because we're all we're all moving to perfection one way or another you might not think about perfection but what is it when you every single time you're thinking I should be doing this I should be doing that um <laughs> I should clean up I should you know I should go on a walk I should pay the bills, I should go to work, I should not go to, you know what I mean? Even when it's our, even in the state of our, our hearts and our minds and the things we say, the way we speak to people, every time we have a should, we have a direction, we have a sense that we should be pointed in a better way, doing better, that's, that's 
perfection in a sense. That's like where where <laughs> we're doing it right. And so that's us always moving and being pointed in a direction. In life, that like that just I know for me, like it it can really take on a really restrictive kind of expectation about what perfection is, that everything is just so and whether you're presenting yourself you know, on social media, or even just the way you look and you dress, the way you are in the street, to to career ambitions, to life ambitions, to the way you think about people around you in comparison to yourself. All of these things have this quality of of us trying to get our lives as perfect or as good or as correct as possible. And that can drive us crazy. You know, that can just be such a such an opportunity for depression and anxiety and all sorts of hell that just starts raging in us when we're really if we really accept that if we really think about life needing to needing to be a certain way and we go to any length to make sure it is that way it's death it's absolutely death and all that we'll do is we'll rot we will really rot behind the facade we'll rot behind the thing that we put up the life we put up the image we put up and so how that applies to life is to start thinking what is it like instead of like what if I didn't build my life like a cathedral for example that has everything sort of monumentally put together and people can come and and ooh and ah maybe or give some kind of like worship to it or something but don't feel like they can live in it and maybe a lot of people don't feel worthy to go there or don't feel comfortable is that what the good life is is that where we're going is that like the perfect life is that the actual is that the actual thing in mind that we're trying to get to or is it something more like a forest something that is like organic and and true inviting and welcoming and open and and absolutely brimming with infinite possibility and variety i don't know about you but that that ignites things in me and change in me in my mentality so that's something small note on that too i'd say is like for, for those of us and for those of you who think about life after death um you know thinking about life after death can be funny because even you know certainly people that i know certainly within myself i understand but even those who really hope and believe in a, a strong sense of life after death the goodness of that are still kind of half i don't know half afraid of it half like nervous half unsure about it and if they might think about it too much it kind of starts to get unsettling it's like what are we going to be doing there what's life going to be like and you know, you know it's gonna you can still imagine that it's going to be beyond our comprehension but if you start to think too seriously about it you can start to go sideways pretty quickly um and I think it has a little bit to do, I mean, it has something to do with this, about thinking of it like a cathedral where everything is going to be in its perfect spot and every bun's going to be in its a certain kind of hierarchy. It's going to be very sterile. It's going to be somehow stifling and unmoving and unlivable. And it has the same kind of feeling. And when you carry that expectation of what perfection is, it's going to be reflected on everything. And so again, the same question about if life in its highest forms is something more like a forest, something more organic, what would it be like if life after death was like that? It was more free, it was more open, it was more it was more like teeming with possibility. It's really just a beautiful sort of full circle image of how this sort of all comes together. And when we come back to Hamlet and how it applies to Hamlet and bring, kind of bringing it home to this. If those sort of things are true, if this intuition about perfection being somehow different is true, then it makes sense that that Hamlet, if it really is great, if it's really close to the heart of things and is really in tune with the way things are, with the way life is, then it itself is going to exhibit that quality, that forest-like quality. And that was my experience from the first reading of it. And even now, in the most recent days, uh, preparing for this, <laughs> almost every, honestly, almost every page I turned to was just igniting all these thoughts and and possibilities and wanting to maybe dive in more and more so um the work in my life really had a strong impact um i could have sp i could maybe have spoken even more just about me personally and how it opened it opened me up from really being quite uh academic and analytical and it was kind of the 
the catalyst for what became a new direction of, of reading and writing and of thinking in more broader, more creative, more um, imaginative ways, more feeling ways. So that that's my experience. Um, thank you for sharing this time with me. I hope this is... I know I've been here and there, but I do hope some of this has been helpful. And I appreciate you watching with me. And um, I'm happy to be here and sharing what I can and helping you and being here for you and with you. So with that, thank you again, and we'll see you next time.